This is episode number 169 of the Mixology Talk podcast. And in January, we've been focusing on no calorie or low calorie sweeteners and how to use them in cocktails. So today, we have a special guest who I'm really, really excited about. I'm an honest to goodness food scientist and even better yet, somebody who has spent quite a few years specializing in sweeteners. Um, so this was very lucky and I'm very, very happy about it. Uh, so we're gonna geek out on all things sweeteners, so stay tuned. Hey everyone, welcome back to Mixology Talk Podcast. Um, I am extremely excited. We have a full-blown food scientist in our midst, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, no-calorie, low-calorie sweetener, but we're going to be asking, answering a bunch of questions along the way, hopefully if we have time. So uh, thank you so much, Zach, for joining us. Um, definitely appreciate you uh, your time. Oh yeah, absolutely, Chris. Glad to be here and um, share, share some of my sweetener knowledge. Oh man, I'm so excited about this. I told my wife that I was like, oh, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to reach out to Reddit and the food science uh, um, subreddit and just see what happens. And uh, when you reached out to me, I was like, I, I, I'm going to talk to a food scientist. So I'm super stoked. Um, I'm, I'm going to geek out a little bit uh, for sure. Um, but like I said, what better person to talk to than somebody that does this for a living. So thank you again. Um, so before we get started, I, I got to ask, uh, what kind of got you started in the whole food science pathway? Because that's a pretty specific path, right? It, it really is. And it's the, the short answer is, is I washed out of chemical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I came into college as my original major. I think it's at 18 years old. We all have some growing up to do. And sure. part of mine was, was academic. So it's, you know, I got in there, you know, did fine first semester or so. And then the workload just hit me like a ton of bricks. Okay. And, you know, based on, based on high school and everything else at that point and stuff, I was not prepared for it. So <laughs> bomb my GPA I had to, I had to find something, something else to do because they were going to, cause I, before I got kicked out of the program, uh -huh. so I actually had, I actually had a fraternity brother who was, who was a food science major and I got to talking to him because he did, he was going to the same kind of industry that I was looking at ag industry. Cause we were from the same, same hometown in, in central Illinois. There was a set of center of ag processing looking through that. And he encouraged me to, to, you know, reach, reach out to some professors in the department and look into taking a couple classes. And it's just when I, and I started and everything just kind of clicked and I just, I knew that was the major for me. Okay. So really fortunate then it's, I actually went back to my hometown after college working for uh, working for a major ag processor, especially doing core working with mostly with corn processing. So that's where the sweetener background comes in. So okay. it's, so I was, you know, helping develop new sweeteners. It was helping a big focus on helping uh, food processing customers. So like the big, the big companies that, you know, mm -hmm. is using, using sweeteners, using high fructose corn syrup, corn syrup, investigating new sweeteners like stevia and monk fruit. And it was kind of all over the place with, with carbohydrates, sweeteners, did a lot of dietary fiber. And then, and then from there I got uh, about five years ago, I moved actually did a complete shift into the salt industry. So switching from agriculture to mining, Whoa. Uh, doing a lot of really similar, really similar type of thing where <clears throat> is um, taking salt products, helping customers use them. In this case, I also get to develop, work with some consumer products and develop and optimize those and just kind of get to have my, get my hands in everything to do with food science and salt. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's quite the transition from sugar to salt, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it like culinary salt, like food additive salt? Um, the direction you're going because I know salt is kind of yep. a big category, right? Yeah, it it is, and we're in we're everywhere. So it's it's highway salt, it's water softening salt. My focus is on there on the culinary. So not only not only the culinary products is of, and it's you know it's, I don't don't want to name companies here, but there are sure. only so many salt companies. It's probably not that hard to figure out. <laughs> right, absolutely. And so, I, I gotta say, I I kind of went down the geek side on the salt too. I remember one year uh, one of my friends gave me like this taster panel of different salts from around the world. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is the best thing in the world. <laughs> and that's, and that's part of what I get to do is there are some, is when I bra branching out more into this, the specialty salts. So I get to get a look, get to work with a lot of those and look at sure. them, uh, you know, and, and try them out, which is, which is pretty cool. Very cool. That's pretty awesome. Um, so the, on the sugar side, you started off kind of with the, a company, you started kind of going down that pathway and developing new sweeteners and 
testing new sweeteners? Was this kind of on a side of like packaged food or just kind of on account over the shelf um, kind of placements like aspartame or something like that? Right. It was more like that. It was, it was on the ingredient side. So they were supplying to those packaged food ones. So you want to test, you want to test them with not only doing base testing, like doing sensory panels and things to determine how these sweeteners taste and how they perform, but then also tr testing them out in the applications that those food processing customers would use. Got it. Okay. So, um, so just uh, for my own information, one of the things I came across was this term called relative sweetness. Um, how do you guys go through um, comparing the different sweetness levels of different sugars uh, that you guys come up with? So a lot, so a lot of it's actually done through sensory panels. So it's actually it's tra trained human panels tasting it and rating them, and it's it's amazing. It's actually where where I was this morning. Why it took me so long to get here uh -huh. is I was is I was actually doing a run through of a sensory study. I'm doing next week where it's in this one, which I was just testing batches after after batches of instant mashed potatoes, <laughs> which that's that's one of the less exciting ones, but. With sweeteners, a lot of times they're testing you know, a sweet application or just testing a sweet solution. But once, but to be on, on these sensory panels, it's not just people off the street. It's they go through months and months of training to be able to even generate data. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, it's actually amazing how they, can, how they can actually quantify things like sweetness just by, by t repetitions of tasting over and over again. Sure, absolutely. Um, and we were at a coffee, kind of total side note, uh, but one of the things that impressed me, we were at a coffee um, tasting, like a professional barista coffee tasting. And one of the things they do kind of on the training side of the palate is they have to actually test to become a taster. So they have like very specific things um, like Nestle's chocolate and it has to be a very specific one and you have to rate it based off the sweetness level and the chocolate level and like give it a number one through ten and how good you score that depends on you know if you become a judge or not and it was really interesting to see them calibrating their taste buds over a large spectrum of different flavors and, and stuff like that uh, is that kind of something similar that you guys do to to kind of get everybody on the same page for tasting yeah that's what we do yeah current right right now with my with my current companies we use an outside lab mm -hmm. that manage all that because it's obviously it's, it's very extremely extremely labor and capital intensive to be able to run your own sensory panels but yeah with my previous company though they actually had internal sensory so i worked really closely with them as i mm -hmm. sat across the office from them and listened to them all day but it is, is a lot like that and it's and not everybody can not everybody can do it and not everybody can do everything so it's you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of like uh, like super tasters and non tasters yeah. for certain mm -hmm. bitter compounds, is then if you're testing something where where certain bitter factors or things are need to be rated and tested, there are some people that can't that can't participate just because they genetically can't taste it enough. Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty fascinating. I always wanted to kind of figure out or talk to somebody about that, the behind the scenes of how these numbers are driven and how they come up. But uh, it sounds like that's. That's kind of how, uh, how it all works out. That's really fascinating. Very cool. Um, so when you talk about sugars and sweeteners, um, it's a huge topic. There's so many different things that kind of fall into that major category of food, I guess. Um, is there a way as a food scientist, you kind of put sugars into different categories? Yeah, there is. I think a lot, consumers tend to think more in terms of, natural sweeter sweeteners and artificial sweeteners but mm -hmm. but depending on you know where they come from but i think it's really a lot a piece of that is marketing and food scientists tend to think more in terms of functionality so sure. you know what compounds are similar what ones function different ways so probably the, the best broad category they come up with would be caloric versus non-caloric so okay. caloric are things basically that's that are present in high enough amounts that they're providing calories so that would be sugar, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, honey, agave syrup, sugar alcohols, you know, sweeteners like that. And then non-caloric are your would be what a lot of people call artificial sweeteners. So but in, in the food industry they call high intensity sweeteners because they're many times sweeter than sugar. So it's so that would be like your aspartame, your sucralose, stevia, monk fruit. Those and most of them are actually have have provide calories. A lot of them are same same caloric value as sugar, but since they're used at such a small level because they can be you know hun hundreds of times sweeter than sugar, is using such a small amount, you're not really getting calories out of it. Got it. Okay, so that's kind of a big big category is 
caloric versus yeah. non-caloric, and then you can probably go into subcategories after that, I assume. Um, yeah, and you just keep keep breaking it down, getting more specific. Right, probably to the nth degree if you really wanted to, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, very cool. So, um, so sugar alcohols are kind of new to the market, then, right? As far as like a consumer product. From a consumer consumer standpoint, yes, they've actually they've been around for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Is most of them are most of them are produced by what we call hydrogenating sugars. So in other words, you you add hydrogen to it under high temperature and pressure. So you break this double bonded oxygen on the sugar molecule and put another another OH, which is an alcohol group, which is why they're called sugar alcohols. Or yeah. technically, they'd be called poly- polyhydric alcohols because it's you know sugar already has a bunch of OH is attached to it, so it's technically already an alcohol. But Got you're just it. making it an alcohol, alcohol to one more degree, exactly. Right. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, because I've come across these uh, these terms, but I haven't really figured out what distinguishes one from the other. So that makes a ton of sense. Right. Um, so, uh, what are some of the common uh, misconceptions around that a lot of consumers have a lot of people that aren't in the industry have around let's say um, a type of sweetener like high fructose corn syrup or some of the other ones that we've um, that you've mentioned so far i think with i mean it's high fructose corn syrup is near and dear to my heart Mm -hmm. based on my background (laughs) and i think it's i think it's one that got got a lot of bad press and a lot of unfair bad press because there was some research into the health effects of high amounts of fructose and just pure fructose. And it's mostly those studies where you're feeding lab rats massive, massive amounts of fructose beyond what anybody could re- would reasonably consume. And they start having, and they start having liver issues. They start having hot, you know, high cholesterol, things like that. And it's really, it's, it's kind of bad marketing because it's, mm. Back whenever they named high fructose corn syrup in the 70s, it, it, was, it wasn't named by marketing people, it was named by scientists. So they, it's, it's, it's not high fructose in that it's high in fructose compared to sugar, it's high in fructose compared to standard corn syrup, which is zero. Oh, I see. So, so really it's... So really, it's like so like HFCs fifty five, which is the most common in beverages, is fifty five percent fructose. So only slightly higher than sugar, which is which is a fifty fifty. Okay. But it was, but at the same time, is is in sensory in sensory studies they did in the seventies, they determined that that was about the closest to a drop in replacement. We could just take out sugar and put in the same amount of HFCs. Got it. Okay, that makes a ton of sense. Then, um, yeah, because I, I know that. Um, when I was doing some research, I came across the fact that agave nectar um, actually has quite a bit more fructose than even high fructose corn syrup. But this is like one of those things where people are like, oh, agave nectar is natural, so it's better for you. But then the whole fructose conversation w- wasn't really part of that health uh, until I guess a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. And yeah, and I actually look, because I wasn't real familiar with agave nectar, so I actually did some digging and I found. I found some sources that say it's very high in fructose. Mm-hmm. I found some that said it was only about 55%, the same as, as high fructose corn syrup. So it's so really, really sure there. It's, it's things like, like ones like that, those people think that, you know, there's, there's this other stuff in there that's not sugar, so it makes it healthier for you. Mm-hmm. But really, it's, you know, it's still 80, 90% sugar. So it's not really make that much of a difference. I was actually, I was visiting over the holidays. I was in Texas visiting my brother and it's uh-huh. on his shelf above his stove. He had, or uh, it was an organic palm sugar and thinking that it was, you know, that it was somehow healthy and a, you know, a better, better sugar to use. But I looked, you look at the back and it's, you know, per 10 gram serving, it's still eight grams of sugar. So even if that other two grams is fiber with the amount, with the amount you're actually using, you're not getting enough to actually make a difference. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Um, and also, uh, so when we talk about um, kind of your experience with these tasting panels and developing sweeteners, um, have you found um, kind of a magic bullet of like either a sweetener, um, non-sugar or um, a combination that really does compare to like a sucrose? Um, with, the, with the high intensity Sweeteners, there's really not yet. They all have their drawbacks. Mm-hmm. What I found in, I don't, I don't know if this is available, I don't think this is really available to consumers, but what I found from a food processing standpoint is generally the more complicated you make them, somehow, sometimes the closer you can get. So usually a lot of sweeteners aren't, 
aren't used by themselves. So for example, aspartame or sucralose has a different sweetness profile in that it's a slow onset. So as when you drink something sweetened with sugar, it hits you right away. Right. But with, with, those with those sweeteners, it takes time to build up. And then there's also a longer linger at the end. So a lot of times what they'll do is they'll, they'll mix it with another sweetener called ace sulfate potassium or ACE-K, okay. which, is very, which is very quick onset, but then, goes, but then it goes away very quickly. So in conjunction, you get more of an even curve, more like sugar. Right, because um, it, it seems like uh, when I taste like a simple syrup, um, you kind of have more of kind of a round experience, right? You right. kind of get that initial hit, you kind of have this rich mouthfeel to it, and it just kind of tapers yeah. off towards the end. Um, where to your point, a lot of the artificial sweeteners that I've tried is like, it's like a flash in a pan. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. yeah. And then without, without that, without, with a much smaller amount of dissolved solids, then you're not getting that mouth feel either because it doesn't, doesn't provide any viscosity. Yeah. So with, with that being said, um, if somebody was kind of developing a simple syrup and they were, they had to go with the non-caloric route of the aspartame, the sucralose, um, that direction, is there something that they could add to it to kind of replace that dissolved solids, that mouthfeel that they're lacking um, if it was a sucrose simple syrup? Usually you'd add, you'd add a thickener. So you'd add, you know, a gum or, or carrageenan or auger, something like that. So it's really the, be, the way to, to, you know, build up that body. And of course, those are, you know, they, they tend to thicken and gel in different ways. So you can't, it's, it's difficult to get exactly there, but you can, you can get pretty close. And it's, you know, it's, it's a better alternative than a lot of times than just having the sweetener where, you know, you have no, you have no body to it. Right. Absolutely. And I think, um, so a couple of weeks ago, we did a, um, essentially, julep, my wife and I did a tasting of six different simple, simple syrup alternatives. Um, I think we went through erythritol, iolose two different monk fruit variations, xylitol and stevia. Um, and it seemed like the xylitol was kind of the clear winner um, from our perspective anyways, because yeah. it had kind of that high dissolved solid uh, portion that you would get from simple syrup. Um, but it also had kind of a more balanced mouthfeel um, and more balanced kind of sugar spike. Um, and then I tried it with doing a blend of xylitol and allulose, and it didn't quite have the same kind of effect. And is it just because they're hitting at different points, or um... it could be, or not getting the total, yeah, or, or maybe not, or maybe the the sweetness levels are different. Problem with like with like xylitol, well, and alle well, allulose isn't a sugar alcohol; it's what's called a rare sugar. So it's oh right, right, it's, yeah. So it's basically a disaccharide, but it's just bonded in a different way, so your body doesn't process it the same way. Mm -hmm. So, but with them is, is part of the problem with sugar alcohols is that none of them really quite get to the level of the sweetness of sucrose. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That was something that we noticed. Um, the xylitol got close. Um, you know, it was, yeah. it was pretty close. Um, but uh, I think there was a little bit of adjustment that we had to do uh, in there for sure. So was there any combinations of sugars that you found that really worked out um, that people could try as far as uh, maybe a combination of caloric, non-caloric, or a couple different variations of calorics um, that would kind of hit that mark or get close to that mark in your experience? Yeah, I think, well, I think one is it's a lot of times it's easier to do it if you do a partial reduction. Don't, if you don't completely replace your sugar and just reduce it, you know, maybe reduce it by half and then, and then add back a high intensity sweetener until you, until you hit that level. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so you use a little bit of sugar just to kind of boost the flavor and get that expectation of kind of what you have and then boost it with something else. Um, right. Kind of complement it with something else. Perfect. Um, very cool. I'm sorry. I'm writing all this stuff down. <laughs> no, no. I just don't think it's... <laughs> um, the sugars. And then, uh, yeah, one thing we tried with a xanthan gum, uh, to your point, to kind of add some body and some texture to it. Um, and that actually did help. Uh, I think one of yeah. his side effects was um, when you actually made the cocktail, it kind of brought all the bubbles together and kind of created this weird film uh, on the top that never yeah, really it's, dissipated. Um, yeah, and you get the yeah, the bubbles just kind of stay there. Right, it absolutely. does that. Yeah, yeah. Xanthan's a good one for liquids. It's used a lot in, in like salad dressings, uh -huh. for example, because it's it's what's called shear thinning. So it's you know if you 
stir it or you, you know, sh- or you squeeze the bottle or, or pound at the bottom of it, it'll, it'll lose viscosity so it can still flow. Got it. So okay. I could like, also make it, make it good for beverages. Yeah. And it turned out really good and it did, did what it needed to, um, you know, added some nice uh, texture to the mouth. And, um, but uh, as we started to sit there and watch, you know, over half an hour or so, we're like, <coughs> that's weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, perfect. Now, since you are kind of like surrounded by sugars or you were at one point, um, is there any sweeteners out there that you just wish people knew more about or that you've come across that has been like super cool? You're like, wow, I wish this was more widely uh, available to people. I think there's some, I, one that's, I don't think it's still not available in the U.S., but there's actually um, a version of Stevia where it's addition, I guess, additional chemical treatment that actually makes it I think, very sugar-like. Oh, really? And it's called, yeah, it's called, it's called usually called GETS. It's glycosylated enzyme-treated stevia. So you basically treat stevia with an enzyme that adds additional glucose units to it. So oh, wow. it's still high sweetness, but it takes away a lot of that licorice or anise taste to it. And it's, it's, as far as I know, it's not approved in the U.S., but it's really common in Japan. Because in, so in the U.S., you know, there's no standard of, there's no standard of what's natural, how uh, you can label it. So really it's, companies kind of have to look at the risk of somebody suing them over it. But in Japan, they have very, they have very strict standards. So it's, if, basically, if you didn't, if you didn't pick it straight off the tree, you can't call it natural. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's, so in that, so in that case, there are, you know, fruit companies care a lot less about 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 natural the way we think of it so it's you know so as whereas a company wants stevia that's just a plant extract because they can call it they can safely call it natural in you know in japan they couldn't do that so it's why not use the the treated version that tastes a lot better i mean it makes sense but i i understand there's a whole governing body behind all this stuff that makes up rules and i'm sure you've been uh, yeah. um yeah, or in this case, it's it's more lack of rules that caused the oh, problem. Fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm sure you've kind of had to navigate this through your career as a uh, sugar scientist of like plotting the course oh, yeah. through, <laughs> through laws and stuff. <laughs> um, and as far as uh, the available sweeteners out there, um, you know, I know this is maybe a little bit controversial question, and feel free to say uh, I, I can't answer that. But is there any? sugars or sweeteners um that you wish people knew more about and to stay away from maybe um from either health concerns or even like a matter of personal taste from health concerns i don't think there are there are a lot that are there are a lot that i think have kind of a bad name because it's you know there were isolated studies that show their potential health problems and it's you know the fda acted acted very proactively and and removed them Mm-hmm. Or like that, or or like for example, like saccharin, where it had the warning on it for a long time, but it's you know it's not it wasn't really proven that it was carcinogenic. It's not something to avoid. Or another another good example is cyclamate, which is still used in Canada, but it was banned in the U.S. in the early '70s because of a couple studies that showed potential health effects. But it's but the studies they for future studies didn't really back it up. It's just nobody ever bothered to go through the approval process again. I see. Okay. So just kind of like we're done, just kind of uh, done with it at that point. Huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Excellent. Well, um, so we hopefully uh, see if you have a little bit more time. I know uh, one of the things that I did was ask our Facebook groups um, if they had some questions they would love to ask you. And there are quite a few. Um, do you have a couple of minutes and we can kind of yeah, go? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Is it really a lot healthier option to use artificial sweeteners as opposing uh, agave or honey? Sometimes some scientists are researching the better tasting blend of these sweeteners. Uh, where can we get these findings? Um, how available are these products to buy and blend at home? Um, what brands does he suggest? I guess it's like five questions actually. <laughs> um, but basically it sounds like... Um, is it, first of all, is it a healthier option to use artificial sweeteners as opposed to agave or honey? I, I think it can be if you're looking in terms of caloric or sugar intake and way of wanting to reduce it. There's really, like you kind of said, there's really none that I would avoid based on health concerns. Mm-hmm. And then I think with when you're talking about caloric sweeteners, it's whether you're using agave or honey or 
just sucrose or high fructose corn syrup, there's really not a big difference in the way your body metabolizes it or uses it. So it's really a matter of personal preference. I think with the the blends, unfortunately, a lot of those aren't available to consumers because it's really it's food it's consumer food companies that are that are experimenting with these blends to put in their products. Mm-hmm. But I kind of touched on earlier is the more complicated you get sometimes, the better it gets. So it's, if you think of a lot of like diet sodas, for example, might just have aspartame and ACE-K or sucralose and ACE-K. Personally, what I think one of the best tasting ones is Diet Mountain Dew because it has aspartame, sucralose, and ACE-K all together. I see. So you probably have that big round flavor that you would get from a natural. Yeah. So I can, so I can tell the difference in the, in the flavor curve and it's, you know, aside from, you know, the mouthfeel because there's no sugar in it. So it's thinner, but I think the sweetness profile is more rounded. Got it. Okay. That makes a ton of sense. Um, perfect. Uh, the next one is, uh, let's see. Um, I would like to know more about how to use low calorie, no calorie sweeteners and homemade fruit syrups and liqueurs. Uh, does it impact shelf life? Um, so in your experience, do some of these non-caloric sweeteners um, or even maybe even sugar alcohols, do they impact shelf life of like a syrup or something like that? They can. With high intensity sweeteners, is you're probably going to see lower shelf life because mm-hmm. it's – so when you're dealing with, you know, like fruit syrups, for example, so up to a certain point when you start dissolving sugar, it's just – it's food for yeast and mold to grow. Right. But then once you get up to a certain level, when you start to get – to what you're using for simple syrup, where it's almost you know, saturated as much sugar as you can hold in water, then it's actually the opposite because it starts putting, it starts uh, generating osmotic pressure. So it actually draws water out of the yeast and mold and keeps them from growing. I see. But when you're but when you're adding these high intensity sweeteners, is there, you don't have that sugar in there. So if there's anything else for for microorganisms to feed off of, then they can grow more readily. I think with with sugar alcohols, you can you can get that concentration up, and then also sugar alcohols generally aren't able to be uh, to be used as food by those microorganisms. I see. So but, the only thing sustaining their life at that point that they could draw from would be the water, um, and there's yeah. not a lot of nutrients, so that probably wouldn't attract a lot of um, of uh, growth. Is, is right, that. probably a lot less. Yeah. One of the problems with the sugar alcohols, though, is they all have is they all have what's called a laxative threshold. So mm-hmm. I probably probably heard like the anecdotal horror stories of somebody eats the entire bag of sugar-free gummy bears and then <laughs> ends up in the bathroom the rest of the day. Uh-huh. So it's there. So most of them are. So depending on, on which one on which one you're using, is they there is a certain amount that you don't want to consume consume more of in a day. You might have some problems. Got it. And uh, honestly, I've if anybody has not gone to Amazon and read the reviews on the sugar-free gummy bears, that, that's your afternoon right there. You will just die. It, there's so many funny stories about this. Um, and it's, it has become a thing. Um, so uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. But uh, to your point though, I think a lot of the ingredients that they were using were some of these uh, sweeteners that probably have what you call the lax- yep. laxative effect. Yeah, I actually have a story. I actually found that found this out the hard way early on in my career. Oh no! <laughs> when I was when I when I was an intern in college, is I was going you know participating in it was in a century panel, but more of an informal one. So it was like employees uh, doing kind of doing kind of quality control on a on a new product line to, to check through things, and it was a it was a snack bar that's covered in sugar free chocolate, and it was the first time it, it was one of my it was my first or second day as an intern. And I got thrown in on this. And so sitting around evaluating these. And what I didn't realize at the time is usually in sensory panels is, you know, you're testing a lot, a lot of samples. You don't mm-hmm. swallow them. They, they provide spit cups <laughs> to get rid of it. I, I didn't realize this. I didn't see what everybody else was doing. So I was just eating this, you know, all these snack bars, just eating one after the other. I'm just like, you know, because you know, I was 22 years old. I didn't care about the calories. I just, right. just kept downing them. They were pretty good. And then it's, at some point we got near the end. My manager looks <laughs> over at me and goes, you aren't eating those, are you? <laughs> and I, you know, I went, yeah, why? She's like, that's, that's a lot of maltitol chocolate. You may have problems later. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody learns, right? Everybody yep. learns. So it's, so I, I did spend part of the afternoon doubled over in pain. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's extreme too, right? It's not just like eh, a little discomfort. It, it's actually quite painful, right? It, it can it can be it depends it depends on on your tolerance and how much you consumed <laughs> right. at that point i had no tolerance <laughs> oh my gosh i'm i'm sorry but thank you for sharing <laughs> <laughs> 
um, so uh, I think this might be the last question. Um, but uh, as far as like talking about sugars and sweeteners, um, there was a book called Liquid Intelligence with David Arnold. I think he actually taught food science at like the Culinary Institute or something. Um, you may have heard of him or read the book, but uh, one of the things that he does is use bricks as a way of establishing baselines for sweetness and, and syrups and, and other things. Um, so that being said, um, is there a way um, that we can get a breakdown of the BRICS readings that are between traditional white sugars, brown sugars, demerars, agaves, all the other, I guess, what they would call caloric or natural sweeteners um, versus like artificial sweeteners? Does that even exist or is it kind of more of a different measurement? It, it probably does. Does I've actually I actually did I just spent some time looking for this online, and and wasn't able able to find it. But usually, so bricks is of course is based on sucrose, so it's a way of measuring dissolved solids. So it's so it's uh, you know a solution that's fifty degrees bricks <coughs> bend light in the same way as a fifty percent solution of sucrose. So it's so it's controlled. You with other we're talking about other sweeteners. There's usually a shift of some kind. So it's, it'll be, you know, a couple degrees off, <coughs> usually not far with, with high intensity sweeteners. Cause there's such, such a small amount. Bricks isn't really useful. You just kind of have to know what you, how much you added, but with other ones are different. So, you know, so brown sugar and Demerara or, you know, they're also sucrose. So you're going to be pretty, pretty, almost, pretty close, almost spot on with, with honey and high fructose corn syrup. You might be a little bit off high fructose corn syrup for example i know is about is about one and a half degrees off i can't remember in which direction mm -hmm. but it gets you pretty close actually one anecdotal story from you know old company is is they would you know make they would ship you know uh train cars of high fructose corn syrup to, to coke or pepsi or whoever and sometimes they'd get a new a new quality control tech that didn't know that so they would look at it and you know, see it's it was supposed to be seventy seven percent solids, but they but it but it reads you know seventy five point five degrees bricks, and would reject an entire train car based oh, on no. it <laughs> until and it would come back to you know to our quality and tech service, and they'd have to come back and you know look at the readings and and then explain to them is you know you need to teach your new quality control people that this is how bricks works with with high fructose corn syrup. Oh, that's brutal. <laughs> And it's got to be terribly expensive too. Oh yeah, it's 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 a lot of corn syrup. <laughs> yeah, holy cow, that's incredible. So when we're talking about some of these other natural or caloric sweeteners, um, I guess somebody could probably just look up what that shift is and kind of derive a pretty equivalent bricks level. Is what it kind of sounds like. Yeah, you should. Yeah, and a lot of times, just as when you're not when you're trying to be real precise, but in in the food industry is they'll just use it as a check and say that, you know, if you're within a couple degrees, you're probably, you're, you know, you're pretty close, you know, knowing that there is going to be a, a slight shift. Got it. Okay. Um, and then you said with, an, with the high um, intensity sweeteners, um, it probably isn't the most accurate measure anyways, because you don't have a ton of dissolved solids. Is that correct? Yeah. Because you have, yeah, you have such a, such a small amount that it's, you know, you're going to try to try to read, you know, 10, it's in hundreds of a degree of a degree bricks. So. Right. And then, so would that be where the relative sweetness is probably your best friend or kind of. Yeah, that is. Yeah. So it, yeah. And yeah. And relative sweetness too is depends on how much you have in there. So it's, you know, if you say aspartame, aspartame is, you know, say 180 times as sweet as sucrose, it's not always 180 times. It's probably 180 times when you're trying to match, you know, a 10% sucrose. But if you go, but the sweetness probably goes up if you have a lower concentration. I mean, for, compare for the amount, and then if you get if you add more, then the relative sweetness gets lower. I see. So if you're going to do a baseline comparison, so if you're going to make a simple syrup with like aspartame, uh, I don't know what the relative sweetness. Let's say 300. Um, it's not a one to one. So you're not going to do simple syrup and then divide the amount of like grams of sugar by 300 to put that much aspartame in because it's not going to get you even it, close at that point, right? Well, it's you. It's useful as a starting point, but yeah. then you know you're going to have to go up or down because it's with with high intensity sweeteners you tend to see a diminishing return. So they get you get less and less out of each additional amount. Got it. Okay, that makes a ton of sense. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I think that was actually a follow up question I had that you went ahead and answered. So I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so um, 
I think that's probably it. Um, so okay. is there anything else that you'd like to um, talk about, promote, uh, any websites you would kind of steer people towards if they want to kind of learn more about sweeteners or um, maybe the food side of sweeteners? Um, that's, that's a very good question. <laughs> the one I try to think of it's, I don't have to, it's my, my big thing is, is I'm really, I really am a big proponent of sound food science over, over marketing and fear. So it's mm -hmm. just, I, I encourage people to, you know, look at their sources and make sure that they're, they're getting, getting reputable sources, especially when it comes to, you know, sweeteners and health and things like that. Great, I, absolutely. And I think that's something that, um, you know, the, the mixology side, if you want to call it that, of, of Tenning Bar, they're really passionate about sourcing, um, finding out, um, you know, where these products come from and how it impacts um, kind of a bigger market. So I think that's great advice, uh, especially when it comes to health. Uh, I think that's really super important. Um, and any other social media you would like to uh, plug or if anybody had any questions, um, are you a big Instagrammer or a Facebook person by any means? I, I am. I definitely, if, uh, if, if there's, uh, if you can, if, if they have questions, it can ask you and you can pass those along. I am That'd more than happy to, to answer more food science questions. It's one of, one of my favorite things. Zach, I cannot thank you enough, man. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. So thank much. you for having me. Yeah. And hopefully we'll have a chance to, uh, to chat in the future. All right. Sounds good. So once again, thank you to Zach for joining us on our podcast. Um, I'm really excited that we had a, a legitimate food scientist on here um, and I really appreciate it. So definitely go check out some of the groups. A lot of the questions that I had for him actually came from both of our groups, both the bartender and the craft cocktail club. Um, so there's something in there for everyone. Um, so go check those out over at abarabove.com slash groups. We're having some great conversations in there, making some great drinks, uh, and it's definitely a ton of fun. So go check those out. Uh, we'll have some more podcasts for everyone in the near future. But until then, I hope you guys are having a great 2020, and we'll have some more podcasts soon. Cheers.